The members belonging to the third section were called Afghan Metro Traders, which meant beings occupied with the study of that branch of knowledge similar to ours, Silkornano, corresponding in part to what your contemporary favorites call mathematics. The members of the fourth group were called Afghan Psychosobers, a name designating those members of the society who made observations of the perceptions, experiencing, and manifestations of beings like themselves, observations that they verified statistically. The members of the fifth group were called Afghan Harnosovers, which meant that they were occupied with the study of the branch of knowledge that combined the two contemporary terrestrial sciences called by your favorites, chemistry, and physics. The members belonging to the sixth section were called Afghan Mithesovers, that is to say, beings who studied all kinds of outer events, whether actualized consciously or arising by themselves, and further studied which of these events were erroneously perceived by beings, and in what circumstances. And as regards the members of the seventh and last group, they were called Afghan Gastrodismissivers. These members of the Afghan society devoted themselves to the study of those manifestations of the three brain beings of their planet proceeding in them not as a result of various functionings coming from impulses of different kinds engendered by data already present in them, but as a result of cosmic influences coming from outside and not depending on the beings themselves. The three brain beings of your planet who became members of this society actually approached objective knowledge to a degree that had never been reached before and perhaps will never be reached again. And here it is impossible not to express regret that, to the great misfortune of the terrestrial three brain beings of all later epochs, just at the moment when, after incredible being efforts by the members of that great society, the required tempo of work had finally been established, both with regard to the conscious discernment of themselves and the unconscious preparation for the welfare of their descendants, just at the height of all their efforts, as I said, certain of them ascertained that something serious was soon to befall their planet. In order to determine the character of the serious event they anticipated, they dispersed over the whole planet and, shortly afterwards, as you already know, the second Transipalmian perturbation occurred to that ill-fated planet of yours. Well then, my boy, after this catastrophe, a number of the members of that great learned society who had survived gradually came together again and, having lost their native land, first settled with other surviving beings in the center of the continent of Graben Sea, but later, when they had somewhat come to themselves after this, cataclysm not according to law, they jointly decided to try to re-establish their society and perhaps to resume and fulfill in practice all the tasks that had formed its basis unfortunately, on that part of the surface of the continent of Graben Sea the abnormal conditions of being existence already established before the catastrophe had by this time begun to boil curiously, and so these surviving members of the Afghan society looked for another place on that continent for their permanent existence more suitable for carrying on their work, which demanded complete seclusion. They 
found a suitable place in the valley of the large river flowing northward on that continent and they all migrated there with their families, in order to continue in seclusion to fulfill the tasks undertaken by their society. The entire region through which this great river filled a first name, Sacronikari. This name was afterwards changed several times and today that region is called Egypt, while the great river then known as Nipohuachi is now, as I have already said, called the Nile. Not long after these former members of the learned society of Akan had settled on this part of the surface of the planet Earth, all the beings of our tribe then existing on that planet migrated to the same place. The relationship of the beings of our tribe with that part of the surface of your planet, and also with those former members of the society of Akan who by chance had survived, came about as follows. I once told you that, just before the second Transipalmian perturbation, R. Python S. During the prophecy had insisted that for the continuation of their existence on that planet all the beings of our tribe should migrate without delay to a definite part of the same continent, now called Africa. The part of the continent indicated by the Python S lay near the source of the river Nipohuachi, and the beings of our tribe existed there during the whole of the second Transipalmian perturbation and also later, when things became relatively normal and most of the surviving terrestrial beings had almost forgotten the catastrophe, and had again formed, just as if nothing had happened to them, one of their famous centers of culture, in the very heart of the future. Africa And while the former members of the Society of Afghans were looking for a suitable place for their permanent existence, they chanced to meet several beings of our tribe, who advised them to migrate farther down the same river. Friendly relations with many of the former members of the Society of Afghans had begun on the continent of Atlantis and went back almost to the founding of that society. Do you remember? I told you that when I descended to that planet for the first time, the beings of our tribe were assembled in the city of San Leos in order, with my participation, to find some way out of the difficult situation that had been created. Well then, those general meetings of ours were held in one of the chapter halls of the principal, cathedral, of the Society of Afghan, and from that time on good relations were established between the beings of our tribe and certain members of that society. And there, in the future Egypt, where both of these groups of beings had migrated as I have described, the relations of the beings of our tribe with those former members who had by chance survived, and also with their descendants, lasted without interruption almost until the departure of our tribe from your planet. The hope of the few surviving members of the Society of Afghans that they will be able to revive the society and carry out its tasks was not fulfilled nevertheless. Thanks to them alone, there was preserved in the presence of the beings of several generations after the loss of Atlantic descent and instinctive conviction of the need for what is called completed personal being. It was also thanks to them that certain attainments of the reason of the three brain beings there survived as long as their reason remained normal, and after a while began to be transmitted mechanically from generation to generation.
Three teams of beings with quite recent periods and even certain beings of the present day. Among the results of the scientific attainments of the members of the Ostan society, transmitted by inheritance, will also unquestionably those imposing and ingenious structures that, during the forced ascent of mine to your planet, I saw being erected by the beings breathing on that part of the present Africa. When I saw this new observatory with my own eyes, the expectations I had formed about it from everything our countrymen had told me were not justified. Nevertheless, this observatory and the other architectural works of the beings of that region proved to be exceedingly ingenious, and aroused in my common presence data that enriched my consciousness with a great deal of productive information. You may clearly represent to yourself and understand how these structures were erected by the three brain beings of this region for the welfare of their being existence it will be enough. I think, if I explain to you in as great detail as possible how the particularity of their ingenious and practical inventions was manifested in this new observatory, on account of which I had decided to visit that place. To begin with, I must inform you of two facts related to the change in the common presence of these three brain beings who have taken your fancy. The first fact is that at the beginning, while they were still existing normally in a manner becoming to all three brain beings in general and while they still had what is called Always me in sight, they could perceive with their own eyes the visibility of all great and small cosmic concentrations existing beyond them during any process of the omnipresent octagon of taking place in their atmosphere up to a distance proper to the vision of ordinary three brain beings. Perfected themselves and who had thereby brought the sensitivity of perception of their organ of sight up to what is called the Oosultratnopian state, acquired, as the three brain beings everywhere else, the possibility of perceiving, at that same distance, the visibility of all cosmic units whose arising and further existence depend upon crystallizations coming directly from the sacred Theomer Melogo, that is to say, from the emanations of our most holy sun absolute. conditions of ordinary being existence had become fixed there, and when, for reasons I have already told you about, great nature was compelled, among other restrictive measures, to degrade the functioning of their organ of sight to what is called it, Kurytnopian, level, proper only to the presence of one brain and two brain beings. From that time on the three brain beings that were able to perceive the visibility of any great or small cosmic concentration situated beyond them only when the sacred process of Iaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiaiai
enabling it at the given moment to perceive the visibility of cosmic concentrations situated beyond them. That is to say, the results of any manifestation of the omnipresent Okadano are perceived only when they take place within certain limits, depending upon the quality of perception attained by the given organ, and beyond these limits what is called the momentum of the impulse dies down, or, to put it otherwise, these beings perceive the visibility of objects only when they are almost next to them. But if these results take place beyond the mentioned limits, this manifestation does not reach those beings in whose presence the organs of visual perception have been formed only by the results of the totality of pseudoquinox. Here it is opportune to recall one of the profound sayings of Ron Moanasa Evan, which very neatly fits the present case, that is, the degree to which the visual perception of your contemporary favorites is limited. This wise saying of his, seldom used there, consists of the following words. Show me the elephant the blind man has seen, and then I will believe that you really see a fly. Well, my boy, thanks to the artificial devices for the observation of other cosmic concentrations which I had seen, and which were being constructed in that future Egypt on the initiative coming from the region of the remote descendants of the members of the Lund Society of Ozan. Any one of these unfortunate favorites of yours, in spite of the Sarites Nopian, Cycles have long before become inherent in them, acquired the power to perceive clearly at any time, as they say, of the day or night, the visibility of all those remote cosmic concentrations which during the process of the general harmonious movement fell within the sphere of their observation. For the limitation of their organ of visual perception they invented the following. Instead of placing their sexuano or telescope on the surface of the planet, as was the custom in those days and still is, they place it very deep within the planet, according to an idea which, by the way, had also come down to them from their remote ancestors and carried out their observations of cosmic time. Sensations found beyond the atmosphere of the Earth through specially hollowed out, staff. The observatory I then saw had five of these staffs, each of them open toward the horizon from a different point in the space occupied by the observatory, but they all converged to a small underground hollow. Something like a cave, from where the specialists of that time, called astrologers, made their observations for the purpose of studying, as I have already told you, the visible presences and the results of the reciprocal action of cosmic concentrations belonging to their own solar system as well as to other systems of our great universe. They made their observations through any one of the five shafts, which looked out in different directions toward the horizon, according to the given position of their planet in the process of the common cosmic harmonious movement in relation to the cosmic concentration being observed. I repeat, my boy, that although the chief particularity of the observatory erected by the three brain beings of the future Egypt was not new to me, since this principle had also been applied in my observatory on Mars, the only difference being that my seven long tubes were 
were placed not within the planet but on its surface. Nevertheless, all their innovations were so interesting that, for any eventuality, I even made a detailed sketch of everything I saw during my stay there, and later made use of some of it in my own observatory. As for the other large structures there, I shall perhaps tell you more about them later. Meanwhile, I shall only say that all these separate, still unfinished structures were laid out not far from the observatory itself and, as I learned upon examining them under the guidance of the chief builder, a friend of one of our tribes, they were intended partly for that. Observation of other suns and planets of our great universe, and partly for determining and intentionally directing the currents of the surrounding atmosphere so as to obtain the climate desired. All these structures occupied a fairly large area in that locality and were enclosed within a special lattice fence made of the plant known there as Zalnakatar. It is very interesting to note here that at the main entrance to that vast enclosure they had erected a rather large stone figure, large of course in comparison with the size of their presences, called the Sphinx, which strongly reminded me of the statue I had seen on my first descent in person to a planet in the city of San just opposite the enormous building belonging to the Learned Society of Octan, which was then known as the Principal Cathedral of this society. The statue I saw in the city of San Leos and which greatly interested me was the emblem of the society and was called Conscience. It represented an allegorical being, each part of whose planetary body represented one part of the planetary body of some definite form of being existing on the Earth, which, according to the notions crystallized in the three green beings there, expressed the perfection one or another being function. The mass of the planetary body of this allegorical being was represented by the trunk of a terrestrial being of definite form called the soul. This soul trunk rested on the four legs of another form of being existing there called lion, and to the part of the trunk called the bat were attached to large wings. Similar in appearance to those of a powerful bird being breeding their call, eagle. And at the place where the head should have been, there, were fixed to the bird's trunk by means of a piece of amber, two breasts representing the breast of a virgin. Single toe. When I became interested in this strange allegorical figure on the continent of Atlantis and inquired about its meaning, one of the learned members of the great society of men beings gave me the following explanation. This allegorical figure is the emblem of the society of Ogdan, and serves as a stimulus for all its members constantly to recall and awaken in themselves the impulses corresponding to those it represents. And he went on to say, Part of this allegorical figure arouses in every member of our society, in the three independently associating parts of his common presence, that is, in the body, in the thoughts, and in the feelings, a shock calling source corresponding associations for the separate realizations which, in their totality, alone make it possible for us to rid ourselves little by little of the maleficent factors present in every one of us. Both those factors transmitted by heredity and those we have ourselves acquired, which gradually engender within us undesirable impulses, as a consequence of which we are not what we might be. This emblem 
Sound of art constantly reminds or communicates to us that it is possible to attain freedom from those factors only if we unremittingly compel our common presences to think, feel, and act under all circumstances in accordance with what is expressed in this allegorical figure. And all of the true members of the Society of Ostans understand our emblem in the following way. The trunk of this allegorical being, represented by that of a bull, means that the factors crystallized in us, both inherited and personally acquired, which engender in our presence of those maleficent impulses can be regenerated only by indefatigable labors, those labors for which, among all the beings of our planet, peace, bull, is particularly fitted. But this trunk rests on the legs of a lion means that these orders must be performed with the awareness and feeling of courage and of faith in one, might, that property possessed in the highest degree, among all the beings of the earth, by the beings to whom these legs belong, the mighty, lion. The wings of the strongest and highest soaring of birds, trees, people, attached to the bull's trunk, constantly remind the members of our society that, during these labors, and while experiencing this inner psychic property of self-respect, one must meditate unceasingly on questions not concerned with the manifestations directly required for ordinary being existence. With regard to strange image of the head of our allegorical being in the form of the breasts of a virgin, this means that love is predominant always and in everything during the inner and outer functioning provoked by one's consciousness. Such a love is to arise and exist only in the presence of concentration formed in the lawful parts of every whole responsible being in whom the host of our common father are placed. And that the head attached to the trunk of the bowl of amber signifies that this love should be strictly impartial, that is to say, completely separated from all the other functions proceeding in every whole responsible being. In order, my bowl, for you to understand the meaning symbolized by the material known there is amber, I must add that amber is one of the seven planetary formations in the arising of this the omnipresent active element, Okadanos enters with its three separate, independent, and sacred parts in equal proportion, and, in the process of planetary actualization, these intraplanetary and planetary formations serve to impede the independent flow of the three separate streams of these three localized sacred parts. At this point in his tale, the elf above paused for a moment, as if pondering something, and then continued. While I was describing to you what I then saw on a part of the surface of your planet still surviving today, where there existed certain direct descendants of the members of that truly great learned society of Ostan, there were gradually revived in me, as a result of the manifestations of my being risen and due to the effect of various associations aroused by the visual impressions of the environment of that region. All the scenes in the whole series of associated thoughts evoking a certain being experience in his mind that occurred during my last stay there when I visited contemporary Egypt and was sitting one day absorbed and thought at the foot of one of those ancient structures which had chance to survive from that period and are called today the pyramid. And in the general 
functioning of my reason here proceeded, among other things, to follow your question. Good. If not even one of the benefits for ordinary being existence formerly attained by the reason of the beings of the continent of Atlantis has come down by inheritance to contemporary beings of the planet, this could perhaps be logically justified by the simple fact that, for cosmic reasons, neither listening to the three grand beings there nor in any way depending upon them, the second great cataclysm not according to law occurred, in which not only this continent itself perished but also almost everything existing upon it. With Egypt, was not as magnificent, so quite recent. There is no denying it. As a result of the third small catastrophe for that ill-fated planet, and of the fifth, about which I will speak later, this part of its surface is covered with sand. Nevertheless, the three green beings dwelling there did not perish, but were only scattered over various other parts of the same continent. And so in whatever new conditions they found themselves, their should have been preserved in their presence the crystallized results of the factors perfected for normal, being logical mentation, transmitted to them by heredity.
and three marching days later, kissing the with me, I ascended on the same ship to the planet Saturn.
to the lyrics too, and you can find out the exact cause of a particular area so it's nominal for three brain beings. That is why, my boys, in the interval between my fourth and fifth surgeons on the planet Earth, in order to have more material that might throw light upon this question that interests me so intensely, with the help of my Hexplano on the planet Mars, I organized my observations of the existence of those peculiar three brain beings in the following way. I purposely selected a large number of individual beings from among your favorites, and very many of your leaders, either I personally or someone I specially commissioned kept them under close observation, trying as much as possible not to miss anything, and to clarify for myself from every aspect all the particularities in their manifestations during the process of their ordinary existence. And I must confess, my day, that when I happen to be quite free, I sometimes follow with great interest, for hold, Tino Nunes, or, as her favorite approximately define the corresponding flow of time, for hold, hours, the movements of those three brains being selected by me. Trying to find a logical explanation for what are called there, and so, one day, while I was carrying on these observations from the planet Mars to my Tesuano, it flashed upon me that the length of their existence was, century by century, and even year by year, becoming shorter, at a very definite and uniform rate, and this served as the starting point for my subsequent intensive study of the psyche of these three brained beings who have taken your fancy. Of course, when I first became aware of this, I immediately took into account not only the chief particularity of their psyche, that is, their periodic reciprocal destruction, but also the innumerable what are called diseases, found exclusively on that planet, and most of which, by the way, arose and continue to arise owing as always to the abnormal external conditions of ordinary being existence they themselves have established, conditions that are greatly to blame for their inability to exist normally until the sacred, Rascuarno. When I noticed this for the first time, and began to recall my former impressions on the subject, this fact flashed upon my essence, and each of the separate independent spiritualized parts of my whole presence became filled with the conviction that in the beginning these three brain beings of your planet had actually existed, according to their time calculation, for as many as twelve, and some of them even for fifteen centuries. For you to have a clearer picture of the rate at which the length of their existence diminished during this period, it is enough to tell you that when I left that solar system forever, the maximum length of their existence had decreased to no more than 70 to 90 of their years. And in recent times, if one of them were to exist even as long as this, all the other beings of that peculiar planet would consider that he had lived to a great age. And if anyone were to exist for a little over a century he would be exhibited in their museums, and of course all the rest of the beings there would know about him because his photograph, and descriptions of his manner of existence, down to each step he takes, would keep appearing in all their, newspapers, as they are called. So, my boy, since at the time when I suddenly became aware of this fact I had no special business on the planet Mars, 
And since it was quite impossible to try to probe this new peculiarity by means of the Tesquano, I decided to go in person to the planet Earth, in order to clear up for myself on the spot the causes of this phenomenon. Several Martian days after my decision, I again flew there on the ship occasion. At the time of this fifth flight of mine to your planet, there, center for the incoming and outgoing results of the perfecting of being comprehension, or there, center of culture, as they call it, was the city of Babylon, so it was just there that I decided to go. This time our ship occasion alighted on what is now called the Persian Gulf, because before our flight we had ascertained through the Tesquano that the most convenient place both for our plan of travel, which was to reach the city of Babylon, and for the mooring of our ship occasion would be that particular Salyukoriachnian space of the surface of your planet. This expanse of water was convenient for my further travels because the large river on whose banks stood the city of Babylon flowed into it, and we proposed to go up this river in order to reach the city. In those days, the incomparably majestic Babylon was flourishing in every respect it was a center of culture, not only for the beings dwelling on the continent of Ashark but also for the beings of all the other land masses, large and small, which were adapted to the needs of ordinary being existence on that planet. When I first arrived in this center of culture, of theirs, they were just then preparing what later became the principal cause of acceleration in the rate of degeneration of their psychic organization, especially in the sense of the atrophy in them of the instinctive functioning of those three fundamental factors which ought to exist in the presence of every three-brained being, namely, those factors which give rise to the being impulses existing under the names of faith, hope, and love. Single quote. And the degeneration of these being factors, increasing from one generation to another, has reached such a point that instead of the real being sight that should exist in the presence of every kind of three-brained being, there now exists in the presence of your contemporary favorites a real psyche, to be sure, but one that can be very well described by the following wise saying of our dear Mullah Nasser Eddin, it has everything in it except the core, or even the kernel. I must not fail to tell you as fully as possible what occurred during that period in Babylon, as all this information may serve you as valuable material for helping to elucidate and transmute in your reason all the causes that taken together have finally given rise to that psyche, so strange for three centered beings, which your contemporary favorites now have. To begin with, I must tell you that I obtained the information about the events I am going to relate chiefly from those beings whom the other three centered beings there call, learned. And before going any further, I must dwell a little on just what kind of beings are considered, learned, by the others on your planet. sojourn there, that is, before the period when, as I have told you, Babylon was in full flower, those who were regarded by others as learned, 
Were not such beings as become worthy to be considered learned everywhere else in the universe, namely, those who from the earliest times, even on your planet, have acquired by their conscious labor and intentional suffering the ability to contemplate all the details of everything that exists from the point of view of world arising and world existence, which enables them to perfect their highest being body to the corresponding degree of the sacred scale of objective reason, and later to sense the cosmic truths accessible to this highest body, according to its level of development but ever since the time of what is called the Tikliamitian civilization, and especially in our era, the beings there who become learned, are almost always those who have learned by rote the greatest possible amount of vacuous information, such as old women love to repeat about what was supposed to have been said in the good old days. Note, by the way, that our venerated Mullah Nasser Eddin expresses the importance of such learned beings as follows. Everybody seems to believe that our learned professors know that half a hundred is fifty. There on your planet, the more such information one of your favorites stores up, information he has never verified, and moreover has never sensed for himself, the more learned he is considered to be. Well, my boy, when we reached the city of Babylon, it was literally overflowing with learned beings who were gathered there from almost everywhere on your planet. As the reason for their gathering is extremely interesting, I will tell you something about this also. The point is that most of the learned beings of the earth had been assembled there under compulsion by a highly eccentric Persian king, under whose dominion at that period was also the city of Babylon. To help you understand the fundamental aspect of all the results of the abnormal conditions of ordinary being existence that gave rise to the eccentricity of this Persian king, I must first enlighten you about two facts that had been established long before. The first of these facts is that, almost from the time of the loss of the continent of Atlantis, there gradually began to be crystallized and in later centuries to be definitely fixed in the presence of every one of your favorites a particular property, thanks to which the sensation called happiness for one's being, experienced from time to time by every three-brained being from the satisfaction of his inner self-evaluation, appears in their presence exclusively when they have at their disposal a great deal of that famous metal they call, gold. Single quote. The worst of it is that, because of this particular property in their common presence, the sensation arising from the possession of that metal is reinforced by the beings surrounding the possessor, and even by those beings who learn about it only by hearsay rather than through their own perceptions at the same time it is the custom there never to take into account the kind of being manifestations through which someone came to own a great quantity of this metal, and what is more, such a being evokes in the presences of all those around him the functioning of that crystallized consequence of the properties of the organ kunda buffer called envy. And the second fact is this, that when their chief particularity functions in the presences of your favorites at an accelerated tempo, and the process of reciprocal destruction breaks out among their different communities according to established custom, then after this maleficent property, inherent in them alone, has run its course and this process of theirs ceases for a while, the king of the community in which a greater number of subjects has survived survived, on receiving the title of 
conqueror, usually seizes for himself everything belonging to the beings of the conquered community. The king conqueror then usually commands his subjects to despoil the conquered community of all their lands, and to seize all the young beings of female sex and all the riches accumulated in the course of centuries. Well, my boy, when the subjects of that eccentric Persian king conquered the beings of another community, he ordered them not to take or even touch any of these, but instead to bring back as captives only the learned beings of the conquered community. In order to represent clearly to yourself and understand just why this peculiar craze, proper to him alone, arose in the individuality of that Persian king, you must know that at the period of the Tikliamitian civilization, in the town of Chikleral, a learned three-brained being by the name of Harnakum, whose essence later became crystallized into what is called an eternal Hasnamus individual, invented the notion that any old metal you like, found in abundance on the surface of that planet, could easily be transformed into the rare metal, gold, and that all you needed to know for this was one very small secret. This pernicious invention of his became widely spread there and, having become crystallized in the presence of the beings of that time, passed from generation to generation and gradually took the form of a maleficent, fantastic science under the name of alchemy, the very name of that great science which had indeed existed there as a branch of genuine knowledge during long past epochs when the consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer had not yet been completely crystallized in the presence of their ancestors, a science that could have been most useful, or indeed essential, for all three brained beings there, even of contemporary times. Now at that period to which my tale relates, this Persian king needed for one or another of his undoubtedly Hasnamusian aims a large amount of the metal called gold, rare on the surface of the earth, and as he had heard about this method, invented by the future Hasnamus individual Harnakum, he was eager to obtain gold by so easy a means. When this Persian king had definitely decided to obtain gold by means of alchemy, he realized then and there with the whole of his being that he did not yet know that little secret, without which it was absolutely impossible to fulfill this desire so he began to ponder how to find out that little secret, and this pondering of his led to the following conclusion. Since the learned already have knowledge of every other kind of mystery, there must be at least one of them to whom this mystery is known. Having finally reached this conclusion, he began to wonder with an intensified functioning of being astonishment, why such a simple idea had never entered his head before and summoning certain of his faithful subjects, he ordered them to find out which of the learned beings of his capital knew about this mystery. When it was reported to him the following day that not a single one of the learned beings of the capital knew this secret, he ordered further inquiries to be made among learned beings of his entire realm and, when after several days he received the same negative reply, he began once more to ponder, this time very seriously. His serious reflection first led his reason to the conclusion that one or another of the learned beings of his community undoubtedly knew this secret. secret but of course, since, professional secrecy, was strictly observed among beings of that fraternity, nobody was willing to reveal it.
it. He then realized that it was necessary not merely to question, but to put pressure on the learned beings to compel them to reply. That same day, he gave appropriate instructions to his closest assistants in such matters, and they immediately began making interrogations, using methods that had long been customary among power-possessing beings for interrogating ordinary beings. And when this eccentric Persian king finally became convinced that the learned beings of his community really knew nothing about this mystery, he began to look in other communities for learned beings who might know about it. As the kings of these other communities were unwilling to hand over their learned beings for interrogation, he decided to compel these recalcitrant rulers by force and so, at the head of the numerous hordes under his sway, he set off on what are called, military expeditions. This Persian king had many hordes in subjection to him because at that period, thanks to the foreseeing adaptability of great nature, what is called the birth rate had increased among the beings of the part of the surface of your planet where his kingdom was situated. Moreover, at this same period, the conditions required for the common cosmic trogo-autogocratic process were being actualized whereby there had to issue from this region of the surface of your planet more of those vibrations that arise from the destruction of the existence of beings. At this point Hassan interrupted Beelzebub with the following words. Dear Grandfather, I do not understand why the issuing of the vibrations required to actualize this most great cosmic process should depend on a particular region of the surface of the planet. To his grandson's question Beelzebub replied. Since before long I intend to make the problem of the terrible process of reciprocal destruction, which they call, war, the theme of one of my tales concerning the three-brained beings of the planet Earth, it is better to defer this question of yours until this special tale, because then, I think, you will understand it clearly. Having said this, Beelzebub returned to his narrative about the Babylonian events. When this eccentric Persian king with his subject hordes began to conquer the beings of other communities and to carry off their learned beings by force, he assigned the city of Babylon as a gathering place for them and there they were taken in order that this lord of half the continent of Asia could interrogate them as he pleased, in the hope that one of them might happen to know the secret of turning base metal into gold. With the same aim he even undertook what is called a campaign into the country of Egypt. And he undertook this campaign because at that period the learned beings of all the continents were assembled there, the opinion being widely held that more information pertaining to their various sciences was available in this Egypt than anywhere else on their planet. Planet this Persian conqueror then carried off from Egypt all the learned beings he found there, both the native ones and those from other communities, and among their number were several Egyptian priests, descendants of those learned members of the society of Octans who, having chance to survive, had been the first to populate that country. But when a little later a new craze arose in the presence, of that eccentric Persian king, this time for the process itself of the destruction of the existence of his fellow beings, 
The new craze supplanted the former one, and he forgot all about the learned beings, who then began to exist freely in the city of Babylon awaiting his further instructions. The learned beings thus assembled from almost the whole of the planet in the city of Babylon often used to meet together, and of course, as is proper to learned beings on the planet earth they discussed among themselves questions immeasurably beyond their comprehension from which they could never derive anything useful whatsoever either for themselves or for the ordinary beings there well it was precisely during these meetings and discussions that there arose among them as generally happens with terrestrial learned beings a burning question of the day, which this time in some way or other stirred them, as they say, to their very marrow. Single quote. The question that chanced to become the burning question of the day, so vitally affected the whole being of every one of them that they even climbed down from their pedestals and began discussing it not only only with the learned, like themselves, but here, there, and everywhere, with anyone they happen to come across. As a result, the interest aroused by this question gradually spread among all the ordinary three-brained beings then existing in Babylon, and by the time we arrived it had become the question of the day, for everyone everyone there. Not only did the learned beings themselves talk about and discuss this question, but similar conversations and arguments raged like fury among the ordinary beings beings there also. It was talked about and discussed by young and old, by men and women, and even by the Babylonian butchers and all, especially the learned, learned, were exceedingly anxious to know more about this question. Before our arrival there, many of the beings existing in Babylon had even lost their reason over it, and many others were already candidates for losing theirs. This burning question of the day day, which both the sorry scientists and the ordinary beings of the city of Babylon wanted to resolve, was whether or not they had a soul. All sorts of fantastic theories about this question existed in Babylon, and at every moment new theories were being cooked up, and of course, each of these catchy theories had its devotees. In spite of the number and variety of these theories, they were all based upon two quite opposite assumptions. One of these was called the the athe athe atheistic, and the other the idealistic or dualistic. All the dualistic theories maintained the existence of the soul, and of course its immortality, as well as every conceivable tribulation it might suffer after the death of the being, man. And all the atheistic theories maintained just the opposite. In short, my boy, when we arrived in the city of Babylon, there was then t Taking place what What is called the building of the Tower of Babel. Quote 
Having uttered these words, Beelzebub thought a moment and went on as follows. Now I wish to explain to you the ex expression, the building of the Tower of Babel, which I just used and which is very often used. used on your planet by the contemporary three brain beings. I wish to touch upon this expression and explain it to you, first because I chanced to be a witness of all the events that gave rise to it, and second because the history of its arising and its transformation transformation in the understanding of your contemporary favorites Favorites can show you very clearly that Thanks as always to the same abnormally established Established conditions of ordinary being existence. No exact information about events that have really occurred there among beings of former epochs ever reaches the beings of later generations and if something like this expression does happen to reach them, their fantastic reason Reason at once elaborates a whole theory on the basis of it, thus multiplying and in their presence those illusory, being egoplasticory, or what they call, psychic images, thanks to which there has arisen in the universe that strange, unique psyche, which every one of your favorites has. Well, my boy. Boy, when we arrived in Babylon and I began mingling with various beings and making corresponding observations in order to clear up the question that had interested me, almost everywhere I went I ran across those learned beings. beings who were meeting in great numbers, and I began associating exclusively with them, confining my observations to them and to their individualities. Among the learned beings whom I often met for this sake of my aim was a certain Hamelinadir, who had been brought there under compulsion from Egypt. Egypt. During these meetings between this terrestrial three-brained being, Hamelinadir, and myself, almost the same relations were established as in general prevail between three-brained beings who often meet one another. This Hamanadir was one of those learned beings in whose common presence the factors for the impulses of a three-brained being, which which had passed to him by heredity, were not entirely atrophied, and moreover, it turned out that during his preparatory age the responsible beings are beings around him had prepared him to be more or less normally responsible. I should add that at that time there were many many such learned beings in the city of Babylon. Although this learned Hamelinadir was descended from the race of beings called Assyrians, Assyrian, and his arising and preparation for becoming a responsible being had taken place in that very city of Babylon,
Babylon, his knowledge had been acquired in Egypt, in the highest school of all those existing on the earth at that time, called the School for Materializing Thought. When I first met him he was at an age when his eyes, in the sense of intelligently directing the automatic psychic functioning of his common presence, had already attained the maximum stability possible for a three-centered being of the planet Earth at that time, so that during what is called his passive waking state, he had being manifestations that were very clearly expressed, such as consciousness of self, impartiality, sincerity, sensitivity, resourcefulness, and so forth. Shortly after our arrival in Babylon, I began going with this Hamelinadir to various meetings of the learned beings I have mentioned, where I listened to every imaginable kind of what they called report upon the very subject that was then the question of the day and the cause of such agitation of minds throughout Babylon. My friend Hamelinadir was also very wrought up about this burning question. He was agitated and perplexed by the fact that the numerous theories on this subject, the new as well as the old, were all, in spite of their entirely contradictory proofs, equally plausible and convincing. The theories proving that we have a soul, he said, were very logically and con convincingly expounded, but equally logical and convincing were those proving quite the contrary. So that you can put yourself in the place of that that likable Assyrian, I shall explain to you that in general on your planet, then in Babylon as well as at the present time, all the theories on a question question such as that of the beyond, or any other detailed clarification of some particular fact are nearly always invented by those three-brained beings in whom most of the consequences of the properties of the organ kunda buffer have been completely crystallized so that there actively functions in their presence that being property they call cunning owing to this either consciously of course with that sort of reason which they alone possess or automatically, that is of itself, they gradually acquire in their in their common presence the capacity for spotting the weaknesses in Nesses in the psyche of beings like themselves, and this capacity gradually forms data in them for the ability to sense and at times even to understand the peculiar logic of the beings around around them, and according to these data they invent an elaborate sum some theory concerning this or that question and as I have already told you, because of the gradual atrophy of the being function called the instinctive sensing of cosmic truths in most of the three-brained beings there, also owing to the abnormal conditions of ordinary being existence established by them, if one of them happens to develop 
devote himself to an intensive study of any of these theories, he is bound willy-nilly to be convinced by it with the whole of his presence. Well, my boy, seven of their months after our arrival in the city of Babylon I went one day with my friend Hamelin Adir to what is is called a general scientific conference. Single quote. This scientific conference had been convened by the learned beings previously brought there, under compulsion, by the Persian king, who had meanwhile got over his craze for the science of alchemy and forgotten all about it. And there were also present at this conference many other learned beings from other communities. Communities, who had come there voluntarily, as they said, for the love of science. At this general scientific conference that day, the order of speakers was determined by lot. My friend Hamelinadir was among those who were to report on various topics, and therefore drew a lot, it fell to him to speak fifth. Of the speakers who preceded him, some reported on new theories they had invented, while others criticized theories already established and well known to everybody. Everybody. At last came the turn of this likable Assyrian. He mounted what is called the rostrum, and as he did so some attendants hung a placard above it announcing the subject of the speech to be given, as was the custom at that time. The placard stated that the speaker had chosen as his theme the instability of human reason. Single quote. This terrestrial friend of mine began by explaining the structure as as he understood it of the human head brawn and in what cases and in what manner various impressions Impressions are perceived by the other brains of man, and how how it is only after a definite agreement among all the brains that the total results are impressed on the head brain. Single quote. At first he spoke calmly, but the long longer he spoke, the more agitated he became, until his voice rose to a shout as he began to criticize the reason in man. At the same time, he mercilessly criticized his own reason. Still continuing to shout, he very logically and convincingly demonstrated the instability and fickleness of human reason, giving various examples of how easy it is to persuade and convince this reason of anything you like. Although in the midst of the shouting of this terrestrial friend of mine, Hamelinadir, the sound of his sobbing could be heard, nevertheless, even while sobbing, he continued to shout, to every man, and also of course to me, it is quite easy to prove anything whatever, all you need to know is which. Shocks in which associations to arouse in the various brains while one or another, truth, is being proved it is even easy to prove to a man that our whole world and all the people in it are nothing but an illusion, and that the authenticity and reality of the world are nothing but a corn, and what is more, the corn on the big toe of his left foot apart from this corn, nothing in the world exists, everything only, seems, 
and even then only two psychopaths squared quote single quote at this point in the speech of this likable terrestrial three-brained being, an attendant offered him a bowl of water, and after he had eagerly gulped it down, he continued to speak, but now more calmly. He said further, Take myself as an example I am not just an ordinary learned man I am known all over Babylon and in many other cities as an exceedingly learned and wise man. I completed the highest course of study that has ever existed on earth, and the like of which will probably never exist again. But what has this highest development given my reason with respect to that question which, for the past year or two, has been driving all Babylon insane? During this general dementia over the question of the soul, this reason of mine, in spite of its high development, has brought me nothing but, five Fridays a week. Quote, Over this period, I have followed with the greatest attention and utmost seriousness all the old and new theories about the soul, and there is not a single one of them with whose author I do not inwardly agree, for all these theories are very logically and plausibly expounded, and such reason as I have cannot but agree with their logic and plausibility. I myself have written a very lengthy work on this question of the beyond, and no doubt many of those present are familiar with the logic of my thought, and probably there is not one of you here who does not envy this logical thinking of mine. Yet now, I honestly and sincerely declare before you all that, regarding this, question of the beyond, I, with all the knowledge accumulated in me, am neither more nor less than an idiot cube. At this moment in the city of Babylon what is taking place among us is the collective building of a tower by which to ascend to heaven and see with our own eyes what goes on there. This tower is being built of bricks that outwardly all look alike, but that are made of quite different materials. Among these bricks are bricks of iron and wood, and also of dough, and even some of eider down. Well then, with these bricks an immensely high tower is now being built right in the center of Babylon, and every more or less conscious person must realize that sooner or later this tower is certain to fall and crush not only all the people of Babylon but also everything else there. Personally, as I still wish to live, and have no desire to be crushed by the Babylonian tower, I am going away from here at once. And as for all the rest of you, do as you please. He uttered these last words while leaving, and ran off. And from that time, I never saw that likable Assyrian again. As I learned later, he left the city of Babylon that same day forever, and went to Nineveh, and existed somewhere there to a ripe old age I also ascertained that this Hamelinadir never again occupied himself with sciences, and spent the rest of his existence in growing chingari, which in contemporary language is called maize. Well, my boy, the speech of this Hamelinadir at first made such a deep impression upon the beings there that for almost a month they went about, as is said, down in the mouth. Single quote. And when they met one another, they could speak of nothing else, but only recalled and repeated various passages from his speech. They repeated them so often that certain of Hamelinadir's expressions spread among the ordinary beings of Babylon and became what are called, household sayings. 
Some of these sayings have even reached contemporary beings of the planet Earth, and among these is the building of the Tower of Babel. So the beings of today picture to themselves quite clearly that once upon a time a certain tower was built in this city of Babylon to enable beings to ascend in their planetary bodies to God himself. And the contemporary beings also say, and are even quite persuaded, that during the building of this Babylonian tower a confusion of tongues occurred. In general, there have reached the contemporary beings of the planet Earth a great many such isolated expressions, uttered by various beings with reason of former epochs, both from the time when Babylon was the center of culture and from other epochs, concerning some details of a whole understanding, and simply on the basis of these, scraps, your favorites of recent centuries, with their quite nonsensical reason, have cooked up such balderdash as our arch-cunning Lucifer himself might envy. As I already told you, among the many teachings then current in Babylon concerning the question of the beyond, there were two, having nothing in common with each other, that had a large number of adherents. And it was precisely these two teachings, passing from generation to generation of your favorites, which began to confuse their sane being mentation, already muddled enough without that. Although the details of both these teachings underwent changes in the course of their transmission through the generations, the fundamental ideas contained in them remain the same and have even reached contemporary times. One of these two teachings with adherents in Babylon was the dualistic, and the other, the atheistic, thus one of them proved that beings have a soul, and the other, quite the opposite, namely, that they have nothing of the kind. In the dualistic, or idealistic, teaching it was said that within the coarse body of the being man there is a fine and invisible body, which is the soul. This fine body of man is immortal, that is to say, it is never destroyed. It was said further that this fine body, or soul, has to make a corresponding payment for every action of the physical body, whether voluntary or involuntary, and that every man, at birth, already consists of these two bodies, the physical body, and the soul. Single quote. According to this teaching, as soon as a man is born, two invisible spirits perch upon his shoulders. On his right shoulder sits a spirit of good, called an angel, and on his left, a spirit of evil, called a devil. Single quote. From the very first day these spirits record in their notebooks, all the manifestations of the man, the spirit sitting on his right shoulder recording all his so-called good manifestations, or good deeds, and the spirit sitting on his left shoulder, his evil ones. It is among the duties of these two spirits to prompt a man and compel him to carry out as many manifestations as possible in their respective domains. The spirit on the right constantly strives to make the man refrain from those acts which are in the domain of the opposite spirit, and perform as many acts as possible in his own domain. And the spirit on the left is the same thing, but vice versa. In this strange teaching it was further said that these two rival spirits are always contending with each other, and that each strives with might and mind to make the man perform more of those actions which are under his charge. When the man dies, these spirits leave his 
physical body on the earth and take his soul to God who exists somewhere up in heaven. There, up in heaven, this God sits surrounded by his devoted angels and archangels with a pair of scales suspended in front of him. On each side of the scales spirits stand on duty on the right stand the spirits who are called servants of paradise, and these are the angels, and on the left stand the servants of hell, these are the devils. The spirits who have been sitting on the man's shoulders all his life bring his soul after death to God, and God then takes from their hands the notebooks, where the notes of all the man's actions have been written down, and places them on the pans of the scales. On the right pan he puts the notebook of the angel and on the left the notebook of the devil and, depending on which pan sinks lower, God commands the spirits on duty on that side to take this soul into their charge. In the charge of the spirits on duty on the right is the place called paradise. This paradise is a realm of indescribable beauty and splendiferousness. It abounds in magnificent fruits and innumerable fragrant flowers. Enchanting sounds of cherubic songs and seraphic music constantly echo in the air and many other marvels were enumerated whose outer effects, according to the perceptions and cognitions abnormally inherent in the three-brained beings of that strange planet, were likely to evoke, as they say, great satisfaction, in them, that is, the satisfaction of those needs that are unworthy of three-centered beings, which drive from their presence everything, without exception, that was put into it by our common father which is imperative for every three-brained being to possess. The spirits on duty to the left of the scales, who, according to this Babylonian teaching, are the devils, are in charge of what is called hell. As for hell, it was said to be a place without a trace of vegetation, always unimaginably hot, and without a single drop of water. In this, hell, there constantly echo sounds of frightful, cacophony, and furious, insults. All around stand instruments of torture of every conceivable sort, from the rack, and wheel, to machines for, lacerating bodies, and rubbing them with salt, and so on and so forth. In this Babylonian, idealistic, teaching, it was explained in detail that for his, soul, to enter, paradise, a man must constantly strive while on earth to provide as much material as possible for the, notebook, of the spirit angel perched on his right shoulder, since otherwise there would be more material for the record of the spirit on his left shoulder, in which case his soul would inevitably be cast into that most awful, hell. Single quote quote. Here Hassan could restrain himself no longer, and suddenly interrupted Beelzebub with the following words and which of their manifestations did they consider good and which bad. Beelzebub gave his grandson a very strange look and, shaking his head, replied, As regards the question of which being manifestations are considered good on your planet, and which bad, too. Distinct ways of understanding, having nothing in common, have existed from the most ancient times up to the present day. 
The first way of understanding exists there and passes from one generation to another through such three brain beings as were the members of the learned society of Octans on the continent of Atlantis, and through such as those who, several centuries later, after the second Transapalnian perturbation, were beginning, although in a different manner, to acquire almost the same data in the foundation of their common presence, and who were called, initiates. This way of understanding is expressed there as follows. Every deed of a man is good in the objective sense if it is done according to his conscience, and every deed is bad if from it he later experiences remorse. And the second way of understanding arose soon after the wise invention of the great King Koniachin, and, passing from generation to generation through ordinary beings there, it gradually spread over almost the entire planet under the name of morality. Single quote. Here it will be interesting to note one particularity of this morality which was grafted onto it at the very beginning, and ultimately became part and parcel of it. Just what this particularity of terrestrial morality, as you can easily represent to yourself and understand if I tell you that, both inwardly and outwardly, it has acquired the unique property that belongs to the being named, Chameleon. And the strangest and most original aspect of this particularity of the morality, there, especially of the contemporary, morality, is that its functioning automatically depends on the moods of the local authorities, and these moods in their turn depend, also automatically, on the state of the four sources of action existing there under the names of mother-in-law, digestion, John Thomas, and cash. Single quote. The second Babylonian teaching, which had many followers and, passing through the generations also reached your contemporary favorites, was based on one of the atheistic theories of that period. In this teaching of the terrestrial Hasnamusian candidates of that time, it was stated over and over again that there is no God in the world, much less any soul, in man, and that therefore all the arguments and discussions about the soul, are nothing but the delirium of sick visionaries. It was further maintained that there exists in the world only one particular law of mechanics, according to which everything that exists passes from one form into another, that is to say, the results arising from any preceding causes are progressively transformed and become the causes of subsequent results. And therefore man also is a result of some preceding cause and in his turn must serve as the cause of some kind of result. Moreover, it was said that all supernatural phenomena even those actually perceptible to most people, are also nothing but results ensuing from this particular law of mechanics. The full comprehension of this law depends on the progressive, impartial, and all-round knowledge of its manifold details, which can be revealed to a pure reason in proportion to its development. But as regards the reason of man, this is merely the sum of all the impressions he has perceived, from which there gradually arise in him data for the possibility of comparisons, deductions, and conclusions. As a result of all this, he obtains more information concerning various facts around him repeatedly occurring in the same way which in their turn serve in the general organization of man as material for the formation of definite con fictions. And from all this is formed man's reason, that is to say, his own subjective psyche.
whatever may have been said in these two teachings about the soul, and whatever maleficent means were prepared by those learned beings, assembled there from almost the entire planet, for the gradual transformation of the reason of their descendants into a veritable mill of nonsense, the outcome need not have been, in the objective sense, a total calamity, but the full objective terror lay in the fact that there later resulted from these teachings a great evil, not only for their descendants, but maybe even for everything that exists. The point is that during this great agitation of minds in the city of Babylon, when these learned beings, through their collective wise acrings, had acquired in their presences a mass of new data for Hasnamusian manifestations, in addition to those they already had, and when they dispersed and went home to their own countries, they began, of course unconsciously, to propagate everywhere, like contagious bacilli, all those notions which together finally and utterly destroyed the last remnants and even the traces of the results of the holy labors of the very saintly Ashiata Shemash. The remnants, that is to say, of those holy labors, consciously suffered, which he intentionally actualized in order to create the special external conditions of ordinary being existence in which alone the maleficent consequences of the properties of the organ kunda buffer could gradually disappear from the presence of your favorites, so that in their place there could gradually be acquired those properties befitting every three-brained being, whose whole presence is an exact likeness of the whole universe. Another result of the diverse wise acrings on the question of the soul, by those learned beings in the city of Babylon was that, soon after my fifth appearance in person on the surface of your planet, this center of culture of theirs, the incomparable and indeed magnificent Babylon, was in its turn, as is said there, completely swept from the face of the earth, down to its very foundations. Not only was the city of Babylon itself destroyed but also everything acquired and accomplished by the beings who had existed there for many of their centuries. In the name of justice I must say here that the prime initiative for the destruction of the holy labors of Ashiata Shemash did not spring from those learned terrestrial beings then assembled in the city of Babylon, but rather from the invention of a well-known, learned, being who had existed on the continent of Asia several centuries before these Babylonian events his name was Lentrohamsanan, and this being, whose highest being part was coded into a definite unit and perfected to the required gradation of objective reason, became one of those 313 eternal Hasmus individuals who now exist on the small planet bearing the name of retribution. Single quote. I shall tell you more about this Lentrohamsanan since the information about him will help you to understand better the strange psyche of those three brain beings who exist on that peculiar remote planet. But I shall speak of Lentrohamsanan only after I have told you all about the very saintly Ashiata Shemash, since the information about this now most saintly individual and his activities in relation to this planet of yours is of the utmost importance and value for deepening your understanding of the strangeness of the psyche of the three-brained beings who please you and who breed on the planet Earth. Quote. Chapter 25. The very saintly Ashiata Shemash sent from above to the Earth. And so, my boy, now listen very attentively to the information I will give you about the very saintly, 
now common cosmic individual, Ashiata Shimash, and his activities connected with the three brained beings arising and existing on that planet Earth which has taken your fancy. I have already told you more than once that, by the all-gracious command of our infinitely loving common Father Endlessness, our highest and most saintly cosmic individuals sometimes actualize within the presence of some terrestrial three-brained being the definitized conception of a sacred individual, in order that, having become a terrestrial being with such a presence, he might comprehend the situation on the spot and give a suitable new direction to the process of the ordinary being existence of your favorites, thanks to which there could perhaps be removed from their presences the already crystallized consequences of the properties of the organ kunda buffer, as well as the predisposition to new crystallizations. It was just seven centuries before the Babylonian events of which I have spoken that there was actualized in the planetary body of a three-brained being there the definitized conception of a sacred individual named Ashiata Shimash, who became in his turn a messenger from above, and who is now one of the highest and most saintly common cosmic sacred individuals. The conception of Ashiata Shimash took its form in the planetary body of a boy of poor family descended from what is called the Sumerian race, in a small village called Pispaskana, situated not far from Babylon. He grew up and became a responsible being partly in this village and partly in Babylon itself which, although not yet magnificent at that time, was already a famous city. The very saintly Ashiata Shimash was the only messenger sent from above to your planet who by his holy labor succeeded in creating conditions in which for a certain time the existence of its unfortunate beings somewhat resembled the existence of three-brained beings with the same possibilities that inhabit other planets of our great universe and this saint was also the first who for the accomplishment of the mission assigned to him, refused to employ the customary methods established during centuries by all the other messengers from above for the three brain beings of that planet. The very saintly Ashiata Shimash taught nothing whatever to the ordinary three brained beings of the earth nor did he preach anything to them, as was done before and after him by all the other messengers sent from above with the same aim. And in consequence of this, none of his teachings in any form passed from his contemporaries even to the third generation there, let alone to contemporary beings. Definite information relating to his very saintly activities did, however, pass from the contemporaries of the very saintly Ashiata Shimash to the beings of following generations through those known as initiates, by means of a certain legomanism of his deliberations under the title of the terror of the situation. In addition to this, there has been preserved from the period of his very saintly activities, and exists even to the present day, a marble tablet, on which were engraved his counsels and commandments to the beings of that time. And this tablet, which has remained intact, is now the most precious sacred relic of a small group of initiated beings called the Obogmic Brotherhood, whose place of existence is in the middle of the continent of Asia. The name, Obogmic, means, there are no different religions, there is only one God. On my last visit in person to the surface of your planet, I happened to become acquainted with this legomanism, 
which transmitted to the initiated beings of remote generations of the planet Earth the deliberations of the saintly Ashiata Shemash under the title of, The Terror of the Situation. This legomanism was of great help to me in elucidating certain strange aspects of the psyche of these peculiar beings, which until then I had been unable to understand at all, in spite of my careful observations of them during tens of centuries. Dear, beloved grandfather, tell me, please, what does the word, legomanism, mean? asked Hassan. Legomanism, Beelzebub replied, is the name given to one of the means used there for transmitting from generation to generation information about certain events of long past ages through those three-brained beings who have become worthy to be, and to be called, initiates. This means of transmitting information had been devised by the beings of the continent of Atlantis. For your better understanding of how information can be transmitted to beings of succeeding generations by means of a legomanism, I must tell you a little about those beings whom other beings their call, initiates. In former times on the planet Earth, this word was used in one sense only those three-brained beings were called initiates, who had acquired in their presences almost identical objective data, which could be sensed by other beings. But during the last two centuries this word has come to have two different meanings. According to the first meaning it is used, as in the past, to designate those beings who become initiates, thanks to their personal, conscious labor and intentional suffering, and who thus acquire in themselves, as I have already told you, objective merits that are perceptible to other beings of any brain system and that evoke trust and respect. In the other meaning, this word is used as a title conferred upon one another by those beings belonging to what are called robber gangs, which have greatly multiplied there during this period and whose members have as their principal aim to steal from those around them only essence values. Under the pretense of following supernatural or occult sciences, these robber gangs are really occupied and very successfully with this kind of plunder. And so, any and every regular member of such a gang calls himself an initiate. Among these terrestrial initiates of new formation, there are even great initiates, and these great initiates are those who, especially at the present time, in the course of their virtuoso enterprises, go through fire, water, copper pipes, and even through all the roulette halls of Monte Carlo. Well then, my boy, Legomanism, is the name given to the successive transmission of information about long past events on the planet Earth from initiate to initiate of the first kind, that is, between really meritorious beings, transmitting what they themselves have received from similar meritorious beings. For this means of transmitting information we must give the beings of the continent of Atlantis their due, it was a very wise device and did indeed attain their aim. It is in fact the sole means by which information about certain events of long ago has accurately reached beings of later generations. As for the information that passes from generation to generation through the mass of ordinary beings of that planet, either it disappears and is completely forgotten or, as our dear Mullah Nasser Eddin says, all that is left of it is, skin and bones and tails for Shahrazad. 
Hence it is that when a few scraps of information about some event or other do happen to reach the beings of remote generations, and the learned beings of new formation concoct their hodgepodge out of these scraps, a most peculiar and instructive phenomenon occurs when all the cockroaches hear what is in this hodgepodge, the evil spirit of Saint Vitus immediately enters their common presences and dances to his heart's content. As for the way in which the contemporary learned beings of the planet Earth concoct their hodgepodge from scraps of information that reach them, this is very well defined in one of the wise sayings of our dear Mullah Nasser Eddin, consisting of the following words. A flea has been put into the world for just one thing, that when it sneezes that deluge is released which our learned beings so dearly love to describe. I must tell you that when I used to exist among your favorites, it was sometimes almost impossible for me to keep from bursting out laughing, as they would say, when one or another of the learned beings there delivered a lecture or told me personally about some past events of which I myself had been an eyewitness. These lectures and stones are full of such comical fictions that neither our arch cunning lucifer nor his aides could have invented them even if they wanted to chapter 26 the legomanism concerning the deliberations of the very saintly ashiata shemash under the title of the terror of the situation the legomonism Beelzebub continued, through which the deliberations of the very saintly Ashiata Shemash were transmitted began with the following prayer. In the name of the cause of my arising, I will always strive to be just toward every already spiritualized source and toward all sources of future spiritualized manifestations of our common creator, almighty autocrat endlessness. Amen. To me, a trifling particle of the whole of the great whole, it was commanded from above to be coated with the planetary body of a three-centered being of the earth in order to help all other such beings arising and existing upon it to free themselves from the consequences of the properties of that organ which, for great and important reasons, was implanted in the presence of their ancestors. All the sacred individuals before me who were intentionally actualized from above, while striving for this same aim, have always endeavored to accomplish the task laid upon them through one or another of the three sacred ways for self-perfecting foreordained by our endless creator himself, that is, through the sacred ways based on the being impulses called, faith, hope, and, love. Quote, when I had completed my seventeenth year, I began, as commanded from above, to prepare my planetary body in order, during my responsible existence, to be able to be impartial. During this period of my self-preparation it was also my intention that as soon as I reached responsible age, I would carry out the task laid upon me through one or another of these three sacred being impulses. But when during this period of self-preparation I chanced to meet many beings of almost all types, who existed here in the city of Babylon, and when in the course of my impartial observations I became aware of various traits of their being manifestations, there crept into me and progressively increased an essence doubt as to the possibility of saving the three centered beings of this planet by any of these three sacred ways. The different manifestations of the beings I encountered not only increased my doubt, 
but gradually convinced me that the consequences of the properties of the organ kunda buffer, having passed by heredity through many generations over a very long period, had ultimately so crystallized in their presence that they have reached contemporary beings as a lawful part of their essence, and thus these crystallized consequences of the properties of the organ kunda buffer are now, as it were, a second nature of their common presence. So, when I finally became a responsible being, before making my choice of one of the three sacred ways, I decided to bring my planetary body into the state of the sacred, Keshanara, that is, into the state of, all brains balanced being perceptiveness, and only in that state to choose the way for my future activities. With this aim I then ascended, Mount Vezinyama, where for 40 days and nights I knelt on my knees and devoted myself to concentration. For a second 40 days and nights I neither ate nor drank, but recalled and analyzed all the impressions present in me of everything I had perceived during my existence here in the period of my self-preparation. A third 40 days and nights I remained on my knees and neither ate nor drank, and every half hour I plucked two hairs from my breast. And it was only when I had finally attained complete freedom from the influence of all bodily and spiritual associations linked with the impressions of ordinary life that I began to ponder what I was to do. This pondering of my purified reason then brought me to the certainty that it was already too late to save the contemporary beings by any of the three sacred ways. This pondering of mine also made it categorically clear to me that all the genuine functions proper to men beings, as they are proper to all three centered beings of our great universe, had already degenerated in their remote ancestors into quite other functions, which were included among the properties of the organ kunda buffer, and were very similar to the genuine sacred being functions of faith, hope, and love. And in all probability this degeneration was due to the fact that when the organ kunda buffer had been destroyed in their ancestors, and they had acquired in themselves factors for the genuine sacred being impulses, then, as the taste of many of the properties of the organ kunda buffer still remained in them, these properties resembling the three sacred impulses gradually became mixed with the genuine ones, and as a result, factors were crystallized in their psyche for the impulses of faith, hope, and love, which although similar to the genuine were somehow or other quite peculiar. The contemporary three centered beings also at times believe, love, and hope both with their reason and with their feelings, but how they believe, how they love, and how they hope, in this lies all the peculiarity of these three being properties of theirs. They also believe, that in them this sacred impulse does not function independently, as it does in general in all the three centered beings with the same possibilities on the various other planets of our great universe, but its arising is dependent upon certain factors that have been formed in their common presence, owing as always to the consequences of the properties of the organ kunda buffer, as, for instance, those peculiar properties arising in them which they call, vanity, self-love, pride, self-importance, and so forth. In consequence of this, the three-brained beings of the earth are particularly subject to the perception and fixation in their presence of all sorts of sinkerpusarams, or, as it is expressed here, they believe any old twaddle. 
It is very easy to convince a being of this planet of anything you like, provided that during his perception of this nonsense there is a book in him, either consciously from without or automatically by itself, the functioning of one or another corresponding consequence of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer crystallized in him from among those forming what is called his subjectivity, as for instance, self-love, vanity, pride, swagger, presumptuousness, arrogance, and so on. If these influences act upon their degenerate reason and upon the equally degenerate factors in their localizations, factors that actualize being sensations, not only is a false conviction crystallized in them concerning the aforementioned nonsense, but they will even, in all sincerity and faith, prove vehemently to those around them that it is just so and can in no way be otherwise. In an equally abnormal form data have been molded in them for evoking the sacred impulse of love. In the presence of the beings of contemporary times there is as much as you please of that strange impulse they call love, but this love of theirs is also the result of certain crystallized consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer, and this impulse arises and manifests itself in the presence of every one of them entirely subjectively, so subjectively and so differently that if ten of them were asked to explain how they sense this inner impulse of theirs, all of them, if, of course, they for once replied sincerely, and frankly acknowledged their genuine sensations and not those they had read about somewhere or heard about from someone else, all ten would reply differently and describe ten different sensations. One would explain this sensation in the sexual sense, another in the sense of pity, a third is a desire for submission, a fourth, a common interest in outer things, and so on and so forth, but not one of the ten could describe, even remotely, the sensation of genuine love. And none of them could describe it. Because for a long time now none of the ordinary men beings here has ever had any sensation of the sacred being impulse of genuine love and without this taste, they cannot have the faintest idea of that sacred being impulse, the most beatific in the presence of every three-centered being of the universe, which, in accordance with the divine foresight of great nature, forms in us such data that, when we experience their results, we can rest in bliss from the meritorious labors we have fulfilled for the purpose of self-perfection. Nowadays, if one of these three brain beings, loves, somebody or other, it is either because this somebody always encourages and undeservedly flatters him, or because this one's nose is very like the nose of that female or male with whom, thanks to the cosmic law of polarity, or type, a relationship has been established that has not yet been broken, or finally, he loves someone only because this someone's uncle is in business in a big way and may one day give him a boost, and so on and so forth. But never do men beings here love with genuine, impartial, and non-egoistic love. Thanks to the kind of love that exists in the contemporary beings here, their hereditary predisposition to the crystallization of the consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer now proceeds in them without hindrance, and becomes definitely fixed as a lawful part of their nature. And as regards the third sacred being impulse, essence hope, its plight in the presence of the three centered beings here is even worse than that of the first two. Not only has this being impulse, in its distorted form, 
finally adapted itself to the whole of their presence but this newly formed, maleficent, hope, which has taken the place of the being impulse of sacred hope, is now the principal reason why factors can no longer be acquired in them for the functioning of the genuine being impulses of faith, hope, and love. In consequence of this newly formed, abnormal, hope, of theirs, they always hope for something, and this constantly paralyzes all the possibilities that appear in them, whether evoked intentionally from without or arising accidentally within them, possibilities that could perhaps still destroy in their presence their hereditary predisposition to the crystallization of the consequences of the properties of the organ buffer. When I returned from Mount Besniama to the city of Babylon, I continued my observations in order to discover whether it would be possible to help these unfortunates in some other way. Quote, and in the course of a year of special observations of all their manifestations and perceptions, I made it Kategor. Ickily clear to myself that although the factors for engendering in their presence the sacred being impulses of faith, love, and hope have completely degenerated in the beings of this planet, nevertheless, the factor that should engender that being impulse on which, in general, the whole psyche of beings of a three-brained system is based, namely, the impulse existing under the name of, objective conscience, is not yet atrophied in them, and remains in their presence almost in its primordial state. Thanks to the abnormally established conditions of ordinary external being existence here, this factor gradually sank into that consciousness of theirs which they call the subconscious, and as a result, it takes no part whatever in the functioning of their ordinary consciousness. Well, I then understood beyond all doubt, with all the separate ruminating parts making up the whole of my, I, that only if this being factor still surviving in their common presence were to participate in the general functioning of the consciousness under whose direction they pass their daily, as they call it, waking existence, only then would it be possible to save the contemporary terrestrial three brain beings from the consequences of the properties of that organ which was intentionally implanted in their first ancestors. My further pondering confirmed that this could be attained only if their ordinary being existence were to flow for a long time under fully foreseen, corresponding conditions. When these deliberations had been completely transubstantiated in me, I decided to consecrate the whole of myself from that time forward solely to the creation of such conditions here that the functioning of sacred conscience, still surviving in their subconscious, might gradually pass into the functioning of their ordinary consciousness. May the blessing of our Almighty, infinitely loving, common father, uni being, endless creator be upon my decision. Amen. Thus ended the legomanism concerning the deliberations of the very saintly and incomparable Ashiata Shemash, under the title of, The Terror of the Situation. So, my boy, when early in my last sojourn on the surface of your planet I first learned the details of this legomanism which I have just repeated, I at once became interested in the deductions of this later Most High, very saintly common cosmic individual, Ashiata Shemash, and since there existed no other legomanism nor any other source of information concerning his further very saintly activities among those favorites of yours, 
I resolved to investigate in detail and make entirely clear to myself what measures he had taken and how he had carried them out in order to help these unfortunates to free themselves from the consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer, which had passed to them by heredity and were so maleficent for them. And so, as one of my chief tasks during this last sojourn of mine on the surface of your planet, I made a detailed investigation and elucidation of the further very saintly activities among your favorites of the great essence loving, now most high, very saintly common cosmic individual, Ashiata Shemash. As regards the, marble tablet, that by chance remained intact since the time of the very saintly activities of the great Ashiata Shemash, and is today the principal sacred relic of the brotherhood of initiated beings called the Obogmic Brotherhood, I happened, during this last stay of mine on your planet, to see and read what was engraved on it. In the course of my subsequent investigations it turned out that, later on, when this very saintly Ashiata Shemash had established the particular conditions of ordinary being existence he had planned, several of these tablets, on his advice and initiative, were set up in appropriate places in many of the large towns, and upon them were engraved all kinds of precepts and counsels for a corresponding existence. But later, when their big wars began again, all these tablets were destroyed by these strange beings themselves, with the exception of that one which has somehow remained intact, as I have already told you, and is now the property of this brotherhood. On this surviving marble tablet was engraved an inscription concerning the sacred being impulses called, Faith, Love, and, Hope, which was as follows. Faith, Love, and Hope. Faith of consciousness is freedom, faith of feeling is weakness, faith of body is stupidity. Love of consciousness evokes the same in response love of feeling evokes the opposite. Love of body depends only on type and polarity. Hope of consciousness is strength hope of feeling is slavery hope of body is disease. Before telling you more about the activities of the very saintly Ashiata Shemash for the welfare of your favorites, I must, I think, clarify for you at somewhat greater length the inner impulse they call, hope, about which the very saintly Ashiata Shemash remarked that its case is even worse than that of the other two and the special observations and investigations I made later in regard to this strange and abnormal impulse clearly showed me that the factors engendering it in their presence are, in truth, most maleficent for them. Thanks to this abnormal hope of theirs, a singular and very curious disease, with the property of evolving, arose and exists among them even until now, a disease called, tomorrow. This strange disease, tomorrow, has brought the most terrifying results, particularly for those unfortunate three-brained beings there who chance to learn, and become categorically convinced with the whole of their presence, that they possess some very undesirable consequences, and that in order to be delivered from these consequences it is indispensable for them to make certain efforts, which they even know just how to make but never succeed in making, on account of this maleficent disease, tomorrow. And indeed, that is just the maleficent part of this terrifying evil which, owing to various causes great and small, is concentrated in the process of the ordinary being existence of these pitiable three-brained beings, that by putting off, 
from tomorrow till tomorrow, even those unfortunate beings who do by chance learn about all that I have mentioned are also deprived of the possibility of ever attaining anything real. This disease, tomorrow, so maleficent for your favorites, has become an obstacle for contemporary beings not only because it totally deprives them of all possibility of removing from their presence the crystallized consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer, but also because it hinders most of them in honestly discharging even those being obligations of theirs that are quite indispensable in the established conditions of ordinary being existence. Thanks to this disease, tomorrow, the three brained beings there, particularly the contemporary ones, almost always put off, until later, everything that needs to be done at the moment, being convinced that, later, they will do better and more. Even those unfortunates who, either by chance or owing, to a conscious action from outside, become aware through their reason of their complete nullity and begin to sense it with all their separate spiritualized parts, and who happen to learn what being efforts must be made, and how to make them, in order to become such as is proper for three-brained beings to be, even these beings, by putting off, from tomorrow till tomorrow, almost all arrive at the point that one sorrowful day there arise and are manifest in them those forerunners of old age called feebleness and infirmity which are the inevitable lot of all cosmic formations great and small toward the end of their completed existence Here I must not fail to tell you about the strange phenomenon I noted during my observations and studies of the almost entirely degenerate presence of those favorites of yours, that is to say, I definitely established that in many of them, toward the end of their planetary existence, most of the consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer crystallized in their common presence atrophy of their own accord, and some of them even entirely disappear, thanks to which these beings begin to see and sense reality a little better. In such cases there appears in the common presence of these favorites of yours a strong desire to work upon themselves, to work, as they say, for the salvation of their souls. But needless to say, nothing can result from such desires of theirs simply because it is already too late, the time allotted them for this purpose by great nature having already passed, and although they see and feel the necessity of making the required being efforts, yet for the fulfillment of these desires they now have only ineffectual yearnings, and the lawful infirmities of old age. Well, my boy, my research and investigations concerning the further activities of the very saintly Ashiata Shemash. For the welfare of the three-brained beings arising and existing on this planet of yours made the following clear to me. When this great, and as regards his reason almost incomparable, sacred individual became definitely convinced that the sacred ways that exist for the purpose of self-perfection for all three brain beings of the universe were no longer suitable for the beings of the planet Earth. Then, after his year of special observation and studies of their psyche, he again ascended that same Mount Vesniama, and for several terrestrial months contemplated and pondered how to carry out his decision, that is, to save the beings of this planet from their inherited predisposition to the crystallization of the consequences of the properties of the organ Kundabuffer, by means of those data which remained intact in their subcon-
This pondering of his definitely convinced him that it would indeed be possible to save them by means of the data and their common presence for engendering this sacred being impulse, but only if the manifestations of these data surviving in the subconscious were without fail to participate in the functioning of the consciousness under whose direction their daily waking existence flows, and furthermore, only if this being impulse were to be manifested over a long period through every aspect of this consciousness of theirs. Chapter 27 the order of existence created for men by the very saintly Ashiata Shemash. Beelzebub went on to relate the following. My research and investigations also made clear to me that after the very saintly Ashiata Shemash had pondered on Mount Vesnium and had drawn up in his mind a definite plan for his further most saintly activities, he did not return to the city of Babylon but went straight to the city of Julfapal, the capital of a country then called Kurlantek, situated in the middle of the continent of Asia. On arriving there, he first of all entered into relations with the brethren of the Chaftantori Brotherhood, which had its place of existence not far from that city, and whose name signified, to be, or not to be at all. This brotherhood was founded five of their years before the arrival of the very saintly Ashiata Shemash on the initiative of two terrestrial three-brained beings who had become genuine, initiates, according to the principles existing before the Ashiatan epoch. One of these two terrestrial beings who had become genuine initiates was named Poundaliro and the other, Sensaminiriko. You should know, by the way, that in the common presences of both of these genuine terrestrial initiates their highest being parts had already been coded to the gradation called completion, and that, during their further existence, they had time to perfect these highest parts of theirs to the required gradation of sacred objective reason. Thus today, their perfected highest being parts have become worthy to have, and in fact do have, the place of their existence on the holy planet Purgatory. My further exhaustive investigations showed that in all the separate spiritualized parts of the common presences of both of these three-brained beings, Poundaliro and Sensaminiriko, there arose and was continuously sensed the suspicion, which later became a conviction, that owing to some obviously non-lawful causes, something very undesirable, for them had been acquired and was functioning in their general organization and that, moreover, it was impossible for this very, undesirable something, to be removed simply by means of the data present within them. They therefore decided to seek out some other beings like themselves who were striving for the same aim, so that they could try together to rid themselves of this very, undesirable something. They soon found beings corresponding to the same among the monks, dwelling in places called monasteries, of which there were many at that period in the environs of the city of Julfapal. And with these monks whom they had chosen they founded the said brotherhood. So, after arriving in Julfapal, the very saintly Ashiata Shemash established relations with the brethren of the Chaftantori Brotherhood, who were already working on that abnormal functioning of their psyche which they themselves had observed, and he began to enlighten their reason by means of objectively true ideas, 
and to guide their being impulses in such a way that they could sense these truths without the least participation either of the undesirable factors already abnormally crystallized in their presence, or of any new factors that might arise from the results of external perceptions received from the abnormally established forms of ordinary being existence. While thus enlightening the brethren of this Chaptantori Brotherhood and discussing his suppositions and intentions with them, the very saintly Ashiata Shemash was occupied with drawing up the rules, or, as is also said there, the statutes for the Brotherhood which, in association with the brethren he had already initiated, he founded in the city of Gothapal, and which was later called the Hishtabori Brotherhood, a name signifying, only he will be called and become the son of God who acquires in himself conscience. Single quote. Later, when everything had been worked out and organized with the participation of these brethren of the former Chaptantori Brotherhood, the very saintly Ashiata Shemash sent these same brethren to various places and entrusted them, under his general guidance, with the task of spreading the idea that in the subconscious, of all men there are crystallized and always present the data manifested from above for engendering in them the divine impulse of genuine conscience, and that only he who acquires the ableness to let the action of these data participate in the functioning of that consciousness in which he passes his everyday existence has, in an objective sense, the honest right to be called and really to be a genuine son of our common father creator of all that exists. These brethren preached this objective truth at first chiefly among the monks of the many monasteries in the environs of Jolfapal, and later among the ordinary inhabitants of the city. As a result of their preaching they first of all selected 35 serious and well-prepared what are called novices, for this Hishtabori Brotherhood that they had founded in the city of Jolfapal. Thereafter, the very saintly Ashiata Shemash, while continuing to enlighten the minds of the former brethren of the Chaftantori Brotherhood, also undertook, with the help of these brethren, to enlighten the reason of those 35 novices. And so it continued for the whole of one of their years, and only after this did certain of the brethren of the former Chaptantori Brotherhood, as well as certain of the 35 novices, gradually prove worthy to become what are called all rights possessing brethren of this first Hishtabori Brotherhood. According to the statutes drawn up by the very saintly Ashiata Shemash, any one of them could become an all rights possessing brother of the Hishtabori Brotherhood only when, in addition to the attainment of certain other also foreseen objective merits, he could bring himself, in the sense of the ableness consciously to direct the functioning of his own psyche, to the state of knowing how to convince to perfection a hundred other beings, and to prove to them first that the factor for the impulse of objective conscience exists in man, and second how this impulse must be manifested in order that he may respond to the real sense and aim of his existence, moreover, so to convince them that each of these others, in his turn, would acquire in himself the necessary intensity of ableness to convince no fewer than a hundred others also. It was those who became worthy to be such, all rights possessing brethren, of the Hishtabori Brotherhood who were first given the name of, priest. For your better comprehension of the very saintly activities of Ashiata Shemash, you must also know that afterward, 
when all the results of his saintly labors were destroyed, this word, priest, as well as the word, initiate, about which I have already told you, was used and continues to be used by your favorites down to the present time in two quite different senses. In one sense the word, priest, was and still is commonly used, but only in certain places, for unimportant separate groups of those professionals existing there whom everybody now calls, confessors, or, clergymen. And in the other sense, the word, priest, was used and still is used to designate those beings who, by their pious existence and by the merits of their deeds performed for the good of those around them, stand out so much from the rank and file of the ordinary three-brained beings there that whenever they remember them there arises in their presence the process called, gratitude. Single quote. Already during that period, while the very saintly Ashiata Shemash was enlightening the reason of the brethren of the former Chaptantori Brotherhood and of the newly collected 35 novices, there began to spread among the ordinary beings of the city of Jolfapal and its environs the true idea that in the common presence of men beings all the data exist for the manifestation of the divine impulse of conscience, but that this divine impulse does not take part in their general consciousness, and that it takes no part because certain of their manifestations, while bringing them various, immediate satisfactions, destined to be paid for later, and numerous material advantages, nevertheless gradually atrophy the data put into their presence by nature for evoking in other beings around them, without distinction of, brain system, the objective impulse of divine love. This true information began to spread thanks chiefly to the ideally wise foresight of the very saintly Ashiata Shemash, which obliged, as I have already told you, each one striving to become an all rights possessing brother of the Heshtavori Brotherhood to attain, in addition to many definite self earned merits, the ableness to bring the three separate spiritualized and associating parts of a further hundred three brain beings there to sense the divine impulse of conscience. When the organization of the first Heshtabori Brotherhood in the city of Jolfapal had been more or less regulated, and was established in such a way that the further work could be carried on independently, simply under the direction of the reason of the brethren present in the brotherhood, the very saintly Ashiata Shemash himself then said. About choosing from among the all rights possessing brothers those who had begun, consciously by their reason and unconsciously by their feelings, to sense this divine impulse in their subconscious, and who were fully convinced that by certain efforts upon themselves this divine being impulse might become and remain forever an inseparable part of their ordinary consciousness and those who had sensed and become aware of this divine impulse of conscience, and who were called, first degree initiates, he set apart, and he began to enlighten their reason separately concerning, objective truths, which up till then had been quite unknown to the three brain beings of that planet. And it was these, first degree initiates whom he had set apart from the others who were the first to be called, great initiates. You should note that at that time all the principles of being of the initiated beings there were renewed by the very saintly Ashiata Shemash and later came to be called, Ashiata's Renewals. Single quote. Well then, it was to those same, great initiates, who were first set apart that the very saintly, now most saintly, 
Ashiata Shimash then explained in detail, among other things, what this being impulse of objective conscience is, and how factors for its manifestation arise in the presence of three brain beings. And concerning this he once said the following, the factors for the being impulse of objective conscience arise in three brain beings from the localization in their presence of particles of the emanations of the sorrow, of our all-loving and long-suffering, endless creator, that is why the source of manifestation of genuine conscience in three centered beings is sometimes called the representative of the creator. Quote, quote, and this sorrow is formed in our all maintaining common father from the struggle constantly proceeding in the universe between joy and sorrow. Single quote. And he said further. In all the three centered beings of our entire universe without exception, including as men, owing to the data crystallized in our common presence for engendering in us the divine impulse of conscience, all of us, and the whole of our essence in its very foundation are and must be only suffering. And we must be suffering, because this being impulse can come to its full manifestation in us only through the constant struggle between two quite opposite complexes of functioning, issuing from two sources of quite opposite origin, namely between the processes of the functioning of our planetary body and the parallel processes of the functionings arising progressively from the coding and perfecting of our higher being bodies within this planetary body of ours, which processes in their totality actualize every kind of reason in three centered beings. Consequently, like all three centered beings of our great universe, we men existing on the earth, owing to the presence in us also of the factors for engendering the divine impulse of objective conscience, must always inevitably struggle with the two quite opposite functionings arising and proceeding in our common presence, the results of which are always sensed by us either as desires, or as non-desires. And so, only he who consciously assists the process of this inner struggle, and consciously assists the non-desires to prevail over the desires, behaves in accordance with the being of our common Father Creator himself, whereas he who consciously assists the contrary only increases his sorrow. My boy, owing to everything I have just told you, scarcely three years passed before all the ordinary beings of the city of Jolfapal and its environs, and even of many countries of the continent of Asia, not only knew that this divine being impulse of genuine conscience existed in them and that it could take part in the functioning of their ordinary, waking consciousness, and that, in all the brotherhoods of the great prophet Ashiata Shemash the initiates and priests were elucidating and indicating what had to be done and how it had to be done in order to attain this, but what is more, almost all of them began to strive and to exert themselves in order to become priests of the Hishtabori Brotherhood, many branches of which were founded at that period on the continent of Asia, each one functioning almost independently. And these almost independent brotherhoods arose in the following order. When the common work of the brotherhood founded in the city of Jolfapal had finally been established, the very saintly Ashiata Shemash began to send the aforementioned great initiates with appropriate instructions to organize similar brotherhoods in other countries and towns of the continent of Asia, while he himself remained in Jolfapal, and from there he guided the activities of these helpers of his. However, 
whatever it may have been, my boy, it turned out that almost all your favorites, those strange three brain beings, wished and began to strive with all their spiritualized being parts to have divine objective conscience in their ordinary waking consciousness that is to say, most of the beings of Asia of that time began to work upon themselves under the guidance of initiates and priests of the Heshtabori Brotherhood, in order to transfer into their ordinary consciousness the results of the data present in their subconscious for N. Gendering the impulse of genuine divine conscience and thereby, on the one hand, to have the possibility of completely removing from themselves, perhaps forever, the consequences of the properties of the organ tunda buffer, maleficent not only for them personally but also for subsequent generations to whom these properties would pass by heredity and, on the other hand, to have the possibility of consciously taking part in diminishing the sorrow of our common endless father. Owing to all this, at that period, particularly on the continent of Asia, the question of conscience began to predominate during the ordinary process of being existence of your favorites, both in the state of waking consciousness and in the passive instinctive state. Even those three-brained beings of that time in whose presence the taste of this divine impulse had not yet been transubstantiated, and who in their very strange consciousness, proper to them alone, had only the barest indications about this being impulse which could be present in them as well, also tried to manifest themselves in everything according to these indications. The upshot of it all was that within ten terrestrial years there had disappeared of their own accord the two chief forms of abnormally established ordinary being existence there, from which flowed and continue to flow most of the maleficent causes that increasingly prevent the establishment of conditions for at least a normal outer being existence for your unfortunate favorites. In the first place, their division into numerous communities, with various forms of organization for external and even internal existence which they call state organizations, disappeared of itself and, in the second place, there also disappeared in the same way those various what are called castes or classes that had long before been established in these numerous communities of theirs. In my opinion, it was the second of these two chief forms of abnormally established ordinary being existence, namely, the assigning of each other to different classes or castes, that had become, as you will surely understand for yourself later, the basis for the gradual crystallization in the common presence of your favorites of a particular psychic property that in the whole of the universe is inherent exclusively in the presence of those three brain beings. This unique property was formed in them soon after the second Transapalnian perturbation and gradually developing and becoming stronger in them, passed from generation to generation by heredity, until it reached contemporary beings as a lawful and inseparable part of their general psyche, and this particular property they call, egoism. Sometime later, at an appropriate place in my further tales about the three-brained beings of the planet Earth, I will explain to you in detail how, thanks to the abnormal conditions of external being existence established there, your favorites first began assigning each other to various castes and how subsequently, thanks again to similar abnormalities, this maleficent form of mutual relationship has persisted until today but meanwhile you should know that the cause of the arising and their common presence of this unique property of egoism 
was that, owing as always to those abnormally established conditions, soon after the second Transipalnian perturbation their general psyche became dual. This became fully evident to me during my last sojourn on the surface of this planet of yours, when I began to be deeply interested in the legomanism concerning the deliberations of the very saintly Ashiata Shemash entitled, The Terror of the Situation, in the course of my detailed research. and investigations relating to his subsequent very saintly activities and their results, the question arose in me of how and why those factors, obtained from the particles of the emanations of the sorrow of our common Father Creator for the actualizing in their presence of the Divine Being impulse of objective conscience, were crystallized just in their subconscious, and so avoided that final degeneration of all the data placed in them for engendering the being impulses of faith, hope, and love in this strange anomaly, by the way, fully justifies one of the numerous wise sayings of our highly esteemed, irreplaceable, and honorable Mullah Nasser Eddin, which states, Every real happiness for man can arise exclusively from some unhappiness, also real, which he has already experienced. This duality of their general psyche is produced because, on the one hand, various what are called, individual initiatives, issue from that localization in their presence which is always predominant during their waking existence and is nothing but the result of accidentally perceived impressions coming from their abnormal environment, which taken as a whole make up their so-called consciousness, and on the other hand, various other individual initiatives simultaneously issue from that normal localization existing in the presence of every kind of being which they call the subconscious. And because these individual initiatives issue from two different localizations, each of your favorites in his daily waking existence is, as it were, divided into two independent personalities. Here it must be remarked that this duality was also the reason why their presence gradually lost that impulse, indispensable to three-brained beings, called, sincerity. Later, the practice even took root among them of intent, Tionally suppressing this being impulse called sincerity, and now, from the day of their 